uh, both uh, my students and other people from uh, uh, the Duke community and uh, a group of uh, Bogleheads. Uh, and uh, uh, with me here is uh, uh, Steve Thorpe, who has uh, uh, created our local Bogleheads uh, group in, uh, uh, in honor of, of Jack. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm uh, very grateful to Sarah Tom, who uh, created uh, this uh, wonderful poster wel welcoming St. Jack to us, uh, uh, complete with uh, uh, a halo uh, mimicking uh, 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 Renaissance uh, art. And uh, the, uh, I never heard the term uh, St. Jack for Jack Bogle until I was sitting on an airplane and I explained that I was going to a meeting at the Vanguard Company and I was going to listen to uh, uh, John Bogle. And uh, the guy next to me said, St. Jack. And uh, uh, truly justified uh, because Jack Bogle uh, has uh, uh, really reformed uh, our financial system by creating low-cost uh, indexed funds and uh, just uh, uh, facilitating uh, the ability to uh, make a decent uh, return on your money and to channel uh, the funds into productive uses in our economy. Uh, so welcome, uh, uh, Jack Bogle. Thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, this is really a very special treat for us. Uh, well, Professor Tower, thank you. Good to be with you. I'm feeling a little bit, uh, maybe I underdressed for the occasion. If I'd known I was going to be invited and introduced as a saint, I would have put a jacket on or something. Uh, and uh, it's great to be with all of you, and particularly for the young people in the room. Uh, uh, this may surprise you. I really envy all of you. And you're the way I was way back in 1949 when I stumbled on the mutual fund industry in an article in Fortune magazine. And you've got your whole future in front of you now, just as I had then. This is an exciting business. It's grown hugely over that period of time, which has been very favorable for my uh, <laughs> for what I've tried to accomplish. Uh, but um, so I wish you all well. And if you want to go into the investment business, people say, should I go into a business like this? And my answer is always, yes, you should go into the investment business but make it a better business than it is today. Uh, what I thought I'd do this morning is uh, start off with a little bit of background on Vanguard and why we, we are doing what we're doing. And then uh, that maybe take 10, 12 minutes, I don't know exactly. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, Vanguard's structure in, included in that. And then we'll take on some of the questions you've asked. And the ones I've kind of singled out, there are quite a number of similar questions from, from you and the, the students in the audience. Uh, but one is, you know, how, how, does, how does the system work uh, when active management has been so discredited? Uh, we found the emperors had no clothes. And in fact, we found the empire has no clothes. Um, why are people still buying active funds? We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit about other opportunities outside of the mutual fund area. We'll talk about the hedge fund area, for example, which some of you said when you can get those kind of returns, why would you bother with mutual funds? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about picking mutual funds. Is there a way to do it better? Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about past performance. And then I want to talk about some of you who asked this question too, this question that constantly uh, comes up about growth versus value, which is, which is the better path to go. And value is very much in the news, doesn't seem to be doing very much, but we have a few charts on that. So I'm kind of going to try and simplify this. I'm going to try and keep it down to leave time for questions from the floor, uh, those that have not been that I've not tried to answer for you uh, when we when we get to a Q&A period, which we'll probably try and leave maybe 15 minutes or something at the end. So I'm going to start off with uh, uh, I call it strategy follows structure. Uh, what is the what is the Vanguard magic? What did we create here? And we created, although it's not very well recognized, do we have a slide in that? We'll have a slide of it. Uh, for at least a sec. Um, what, what did we create? We created Vanguard as a mutual company owned by its own shareholders and not, by, and not controlled by an outside manager who was in the business to make a profit for himself. 
This is not illicit. It's not illegal. Uh, it's the American way. If you, you need an entrepreneur to start the company, he expects to get rich. And uh, what we did was create a company where the idea was to get the shareholders, uh, make the shareholders rich. So when you see that chart, you'll see we have a different form of ownership. Uh, the fund shareholders own us. A management company it doesn't quite own the funds, it controls them. Uh, we're oriented to deliver high profits to shareholders, where the fact is that our typical competitor is organized to earn very high profits for the management company. And we have plenty of billionaires out there who have tested this water and have been greatly rewarded for it. Uh, our idea is to keep costs low and the industry, because fees are the, the mother's milk of, of investment management, um, would like to keep costs as high as they can. Uh, we'd both like to keep service quality excellent. Um, no question about that. Although with the resources we have, given our low cost, we can afford to invest much more in technology and other ways to improve our services. Uh, we have a high risk aversion, particularly when you get to fixed income funds. And, and the reason for that is if you have a very low cost, you can buy lower yielding and therefore higher quality bonds. And the, the competitors are constantly reaching for lower quality and higher yielding bonds to offset their, their expenses. And this in fact works. Uh, and then when you get to indexing, which was almost nothing when we, well, was nothing, literally nothing when we began, uh, we've approached indexing with missionary zeal and our competitors, those that are in the business, are dragged kicking and screaming into it. And you know, if you want to have a competition between uh, two competitors, one of whom has zeal for his mission, for her mission, and the other one who doesn't want to fight at all and is dragged into the ring kicking and screaming, I don't think you have to spend the rest of your day uh, wondering about who's going to win that battle. And uh, finally, although this has changed a little bit uh, over time here, we, we, we have become a more, a more aggressive marketing firm. I witnessed the six or seven funds we just started, I guess, I guess five or six. Uh, they're very narrow in their market segments, and which people assume that I don't care much for, and I'm just going to let that assumption rest. Uh, our competitors are very aggressive, uh, particularly you see that you see the aggressive in, in uh, exchange traded funds, most aggressive area of the business, the fastest growing area of the business, and uh, it's we, we've got some financial buccaneers in there, uh, everybody looking for a little a niche somewhere create a new kind of an ETF that people will block and buy at the wrong time. And I'm going to talk a little bit about ETFs and their performance in a moment. So that's basically the Vanguard platform. And what it's resulted in is incredible growth. Uh, if you want to put that asset growth chart up, Mike, um, I don't know, very well organized. Um, Yeah, let, let's go back one. Uh, there you can see it's something I never would have expected when I started the company. Uh, these staggering amounts of money that are pouring into our, uh, our management oversight, as you can see from the height of that blue bar, almost entirely in index stock and bond funds. And uh, that $359 billion, it turns out to be a billion dollars a day. And... Uh, you know, even, even Saturdays and Sundays are included there. And, you know, when I talk to uh, our crew members here, we've had 35th anniversaries and go back to almost the beginning of Vanguard. When we began, we used to have a party every time we went over a billion dollars. Three billion, four billion, five billion. I'd get up and give a speech. We'd assemble everybody a billion dollars. And if it were today, I'd be giving a speech every day. You can figure that out pretty easily, which I'm not sure anybody would want to hear. So our cash flow is remarkable and very dominant. And when you see the next chart showing market share uh, or asset growth, uh, you can see that we've separated ourselves from the pack in an enormous way. Uh, you know, up until about 2005, Fidelity was bigger than, than Vanguard. And now we're at, well, actually we're at, I think we say $5 trillion. So Fidelity would now be $3 trillion short of our total. It's, it's a remarkable thing. And our biggest competitors are now exchange uh, index indexers, BlackRock, which has made their business entirely really in, uh, in um, exchange traded funds, 
as has State Street, which has the famous spider, which you can trade all day long in real time if you think that's a good strategy, which it clearly is not. And the only traditional fund groups left in this top group are Fidelity with a little under a trillion, uh, two trillion dollars, and American funds with a little over one and a half trillion dollars. They're both perfectly good firms, uh, but they're having trouble competing in the marketplace. So we can then go to the next chart, Mike. I think you've got on the on the growth side the index share. Um, yeah, uh, this is this is largely because of what I call here the index revolution. Uh, you can see that index assets are um, actually don't we have one showing 43 percent or something like that? Let's go to this one. Uh, the remarkable growth of indexing from zero percent of mutual fund assets is actually 100 to one percent, I think, in 1985 to 4% in 1995, to 16% in 2005, to 41% of all stock fund assets today. And it's only a matter of time since stock fund indexing will be the dominant form of, of, a, of mutual fund assets. It's amazing to see, and we talk a little bit about the consequences, and I'll try and answer that question. Indeed, uh, let, me, let me try and answer it now. Uh, is there such a thing as too big for indexing? Um, indexing index funds, the big three of indexing, Vanguard and BlackRock and State Street, own around 21%, 22% of all companies. Is there a point at which there's a, there's a limit to how much this small number of companies, this oligopoly as we call it, as I call it, uh, a limit to what they own? I'm going to just uh, follow that up by saying there is nothing that precludes it legally, uh, your ownership of um, a certain percentage of a company uh, other than the 1940 Act, the Investment Company Act of 1940, uh, which says that no mutual funds, essentially says no mutual fund can own more than 10% of the voting securities of any corporation. Now, that's a mutual fund. So theoretically, at least, if you have an index fund that owns 10% of Google, you can start another index fund, and it would also own 10% of Google. This is clearly not a viable strategy, not a viable public policy, just let people piling funds on funds. So I'm guessing that the 40 Act will get another look um, when an, an act that was written about mutual funds is now has to deal with fund complexes and a much more complex business, that we will get a new 40 Act somewhere along the way. I'm not sure anybody wants it, but I think public, pu public policy will call, call for it. And uh, so, that's a, it's an amazing thing. The bond, you see the bond thing down below. That also has a terrific growth rate. It's way behind, but it's certainly going to get up to 50%, probably beyond my lifespan, but it will get there sooner or later. So uh, indexing dominant, and then you can show that other indexing chart for a sec, Mike. And you, you can see how the catch-up has been on that semi-log chart there, and uh, indexing growing at 36% a year over that time period and active funds growing at 13% a year. So you end up with a real huge uh, difference when you get all the way out to 17. And so it, it, what is driving the change in the mutual fund industry is the index revolution. And we'll talk about that a little bit because you, have, you all have some questions about that. Uh, let, me, let me now turn to um, growth versus value, I think we'll try. Uh, this is under the general heading or the general rubric of why don't I just buy the winning winning side? And for years and years, uh, we've talked about value as being the winning strategy. But you can see when you look at this chart, this is like a one into one chart. You start with the dollar in growth and start with the dollar in value and just compound that and then uh, divide one into the other and see what the compound rate of return is compared, comparing the two. So um, when, you, when you look at that chart, uh, you'll see that growth and value, if you go back to 87, uh, growth got to 7.3 times the value. And uh, at 89, no, I'm sorry, 2005, I guess roughly, it's 7.2, no progress there in that long period of years. Uh, that's more than a decade. And now that has come down to 5.5 times. So um, I can't see that bottom number there, Mike. What is it? And then since 1999, that's, that's 17, 18 years, you have um, value actually doing better than 
growth, but only by a single percentage point. Following a decade, the previous decade, 88, 99, essentially, when value was 16% and growth was 21. My own view is people is the market takes care of misvaluations between kinds of well, factors, if you will, to use the current expression. And if everybody believes that that, that growth is the value is better than growth, theoretically at least, the value prices of value stocks get bid up, and the prices of growth stocks are left to languish, and the, the aberration or the misvaluation is then, is then corrected. So you can see, while that's it was a very steady rise, an important part of that chart, a very steady rise beginning in the late 1930s into the 1972, and then a huge rise up till 1987, roughly. Um, it's been very stable for a long period of years. I mean, 1987, after all, is 30 years away. Yeah, 30 years away. So be careful when you get assurance that this factor will be that factor along the way. Uh, there's another um, question that came up from all of you. Why don't I just pick winning funds? Well, uh, I mean, so one of the questions referred to like technology stocks, things that are going to grow a lot. And I couldn't help be reminded, I don't have a chart for this, but I couldn't help be reminded of uh, what happened back in the late 1990s when technology is in the driver's seat, all these new companies were created, became a whole business. Uh, the information age, uh, technology, internet, all those kind of funds, were, uh, uh, stocks were, were flourishing, and they all blew up, almost every one of them, 90% of them blew up in the time that ensued because people paid ridiculous prices for them. So it's not knowing ever in investing which kind of industry or factor uh, or company for that matter has the best return uh, it's knowing how that return has had in the past, will it be the same in the future, and then what are you paying for it? And we often overpay for growth stocks very often, uh, and uh, often now I think we're maybe overpaying a little bit for value stocks. I'm not about to make a judgment on that, but um, it's, very, it's just a very hard thing to do to, to pick things in advance, uh, in, in given the, the efficiency of the market, and it really is efficient. Then another factor is that uh, we have a broker out there. The one reason active funds do well is they have this huge sales force, and the sales force has to have you trade for a living. No trade, no money for the salesman. And that is the big attraction of the exchange traded fund. Uh, they can be traded all day long in real time, as the original ad says, and they're very enticing to brokers and even investment advisors because they give the look of activity and the, the commissions that relate to activity, low though they, they may be on a, on, a, on a percentage basis, when you turn them over and over and over and over again, uh, look at TD Waterhouse, for example, you can make a lot of money on trading. So um, there's, a, there's a community that sells active management, and they have a great advantage. They can always find an actively managed fund that beats the market index. It's the easiest thing in the world. You can find a fund for five years, 10 years, 25 years. You can even use Magellan Fund if you want to use this record up to 1992 and when it stopped doing well and still continue that record today and it will look like they beat the market. So it's easy to find funds that beat the market looking back. But the reality of this business is that past performance is a terrible, let me repeat that, a terrible way to look at future performance. And we have this chart, we're going to show it now, it's in my new book, 10th anniversary edition of, of the Common Sense on Mutual Funds, uh, and it's on reversion to the mean. When you do well, you do ill, and when you do ill, you do well. And we've done this for any number of periods, uh, but this is the period 20, 2006 to 2016, and we just compared the returns of funds by uh, quintiles in the... Um, in the first five years with the second. And you'll notice that the funds in return, there were 20% of the funds in the top quintile in the in the first return. Am I doing quintile or quartile? Quartile, right? quartile. Quartile? Quintile, thank you. Uh, and only 14% of them had the highest return in the next five years. 14% more had, had uh, high returns. And 
wind of the bottom quintile. Uh, I'm sorry, 27% went into the low quintile, and 30% went into the bottom quintile. So you've got 28% in the top two quintiles of these top performers, and 57% at the bottom. I mean, is there any clearer example that fund, fund returns tend to revert to the mean? So you might as well buy the lowest return funds is what this, by the way, I wouldn't recommend that. This chart might suggest, because when you take the lowest 20%, almost 50% of them ended up in the top two quintiles, and only 30% ended up in the bottom two quintiles. I mean, that's one and a half times as many. So past performance is not helping you. You believe it will recur, and it does not recur. And it's for that reason that so many mutual fund investors, investors have lower returns than the funds they own. And Morningstar does this day that we compare investor returns with fund returns. And usually the investor returns lag the fund returns by about one and a half percent a year and spread over 10 or 15 years. That is a huge disadvantage uh, to, the, to the fund investor. So be careful about your point. Now, why don't investors realize uh, how, how, how far they, short they've fallen uh, compared to, to, the, uh, to the market index? Let's call it the S&P 500. I think the answer is that they really don't do much in the way of comparison. Uh, let, let me give you an example. If you go back to the early 1980s, we've had one of the great bull markets of all time, and the S&P has grown around 12% a year, which over that period means that an original dollar will give you about $80 at the end of the period. The typical fund has have given you a return of around 10% a year, over that same long span, more than 40 years, that 10% that, that return has produced $40. So you could have had $80 and you got $40. Are you concerned? You look at your broker and you say, my God, I gave him a dollar and he's giving me $40 back. How could there be anything the matter with that? So absolute returns are very important to fund investors. They're uninclined to make these comparisons. Uh, uninclined so far, I think it's going to increasingly be part of the game. And what else is going to be part of the game is we're not looking at 12% returns in the future. And when, when these differences will be much more apparent when some investors are losing uh, in a much lower returning stock market. So that's another part of the, the problem um, of the issue that keeps investors from, from uh, understanding how badly they're doing. And that's been part of my crusade, these books and all, to try to persuade people about the simplicity of using indexing and owning the stock market and holding it forever. And that is the winning strategy. That has to be the winning strategy. If you want to compare it with something else, let's think about this for a minute. Let's think about somebody who, at the beginning of their investment uh, lifetime, uh, decides they'll buy three or four good mutual funds. So they buy three or four good mutual funds, and they're going to live for, if they're 25 years old, they're going to live, I've got bad news for you young people in the audience, you're going to live to age 100. And that's, so you're going to be investing for 75 years. And what's going to happen in 75 years? Well, we know that half of the funds go out of business every decade. We know that the average money manager in a, in a mutual fund lasts about eight years. So you're going to have, let me say, something like 35 or 40 indeterminate fund managers looking at your money uh, at very expensive prices. And when they fail, they turn the portfolio over to a new manager. And he throws out your, your losers and starts all over again, a lot of turnover costs. And the chances that you can do as well as the index are, I believe, zero. Somebody might want to say that they're 1%, but I'd still stick with zero. There's no realistic chance that you could possibly beat the buy and hold U.S stock market forever, or S&P 500 forever. Now, there's a question in there about, what about hedge funds? Why don't I just go to a good hedge fund? They have great returns. Well, the reality of hedge funds is they got great PR, because you want to put the next slide up, the hedge fund slide. We just compared them with a simple balanced index, probably very much close to the balanced index fund that I started back in 1993. It is balanced index, it is, it is balanced index fund. Uh, so it's after all costs, and uh, the balanced index fund is 60% um, total, total stock market, 
and 40% uh, total bond market, U.S. bond market. And you can see that from 1993 to around 2010, uh, the hedge funds had a huge edge, and they've totally lost it since then. Uh, will it come back? How would I know? We never know those things. But when you put the hedge fund return in, in, into perspective and reality, you can see that they barely beat the balanced index fund, and they're going to have a much higher volatility. Uh, they don't have full stock market volatility. They're a little more conservative than that. But after all those winning years, they've got great PR. And since then, when everybody jumped on the bandwagon, and that's probably 2009 in there, that was the high, um, all of a sudden that was the end of the train. And that's a reversion to the mean, too. But I think in hedge funds cases, it's more than just reversion to the mean. I think what it is is some of these hedge fund managers are absolutely brilliant. There's no question about that. They're, they're very motivated. Uh, they're very entrepreneurial. Uh, they're very creative. Uh, they can act very quickly to the extent that does them any good. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, no. And the stars make a billion dollars a year or more. Uh, and uh, so it's a nice living for them, too. But uh, they can't keep doing it forever. And more and more of them come into the hedge fund business to try and get these entrepreneurial rewards. And the more brilliant people there are in a given sector of the market, the more difficult it is to beat the average. It's brilliant people competing with brilliant people. And on average, they're going to be average. So um, that's a really important uh, point, I think, when we think about hedge funds. I don't have the same kind of comparable data on, um, on uh, private equity but it will not look totally different from that. There's not a lot of evidence that private equity does better either. And that what private equity means to some of you who are starting off with a couple of hundred dollars or a couple of thousand dollars, it has no meaning. And a private equity fund would be a difficult thing to do because of marketability. But I think private equity like hedge funds are proving to be greatly overrated. So I'm still a buy and hold a mutual fund guy from start to finish. Um, let me, um, I think maybe. Do international? Yeah, we can do international. That, that's a fun one. I mean, I hate it. But uh, in, in my first book, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's a funny, funny designation. In my first book in 1993, I was asked about international. I wanted to deal with international. And I said, because of things like fluctuating currency values, um, fluctuating institutional risk, sovereign risk, if you will, uh, comparing these non-U.S. companies with U.S. companies where we have the greatest technology in the world, uh, where we have the most entrepreneurial spirit, we have the best institutions or did have the best institutions in the world. I think it's a bad bet. And I don't think, I think you're taking extra risk to get what will probably be a similar return. And I wrote that in 1993. You can kind of pick that out in the chart, just where that dip in both the orange and the blue uh, charts come. And uh, since then, I, I said, so my conclusion was, you do not need any non-U.S. stocks in your portfolio. To which I add, uh, U.S. stocks are definitely international stocks. They get half of their revenues from abroad. Uh, they get half of their uh, earnings from abroad. And they can hold their own with anybody in the world without currency risk and those other risks I mentioned. So I left it there. I said, in any event, don't own more than 20% of your portfolio. So what happened from then on, I don't know why this didn't begin in 1993, but in any event, uh, S&P has just greatly outperformed uh, the European, Australia, Asian, uh, Far East index uh, by in roughly the same period, 10% a year, um, and interestingly enough, there, uh, both uh, U.S. dollars and local currency uh, gave the same return. Last year, it appeared that uh, non-U.S. stocks did much better, but that was strictly 100% currency uh, play, because you can see on, on the constant dollars, U.S. dollars, uh, the, that's all the way over on the right of that blue line, you can see that on U.S. dollars, uh, the S&P uh, lost ground, but on local currency, the S&P gained ground last year. Very few people are aware of that. So, and, and then I go further and say, 
you know, look look at when you, when you look at an index. Uh, this is a good good rule for all of you. Investigate what it has, and you probably know this, but the three largest uh, countries in the EFA index are Japan, Great Britain, and France. And when you look at those countries, I mean, think about Japan. So structured, closed society, uh, no immigration, uh, shrinking population. Uh, is that really a good bet? Is Britain, if they're going to go ahead, particularly with Brexit, a good bet? Is France, we've got a new, a new premier there, prime minister, uh, who's going to try and get their labor to go to work in the summer. I don't know if they'll be successful or not. There's a lot of, a lot of rules against that over there. But will those three companies, they're about a third, I think, of the index, uh, will they be able to do better than the U.S. index, Britain, France, and Japan? I mean, I doubt it, but you have to make your own judgment. All of that said, what I say today, what I said back in 1993, and I would say I'm not so darn sure, and maybe we should rethink international bet or non-U.S., uh, just because it has lagged so much for so long. Is it possible we'll get some reversion of the mean? Of course it's possible. So I don't mean to be doctrinaire and saying you do not need international today or non-U.S., uh, as I could with such clarity back in 1993. But if you have to keep an open mind to it, I don't do it myself. But it's worth keeping an open mind to it, more open mind than you might, you might think. People keep saying, I hate non-U.S. stock. I reserve hatred. Well, I, I, I don't allow myself to hate inanimate objects like indexes. So um, it's probably a good rule for all of you. Um, so that's one of that area where everybody criticizes me for my, and then they may be right. After all these years, they may be right. More power to them. Uh, certainly, you, you don't want too much in non-U.S. stocks, and I think the market weight is too much. It's roughly, I think, around now, around 50-50 U.S. Uh, but if you want to get a little bright about what international or what non-U.S. looked like in 1989, Japan was, gosh, I think, 65% of the world index. Very large. Japan was the dominant, the dominant country in the world index. We over, we well over half of the market cap with stock selling at God knows what, yielding a quarter one percent, and probably selling if they did the earnings right at 100 times earnings. And that that can't go on either. So the valuation may be a little bit better. I think I don't know if you recall, Mike, that we. Kind of a performance argument, which we'll put up. And we just we just got last summer for the first time uh, how indexing is really done, and uh, this is outperforming their benchmark, whether it's large growth, large cap, uh, large core, large value, or mid cap in the same categories. And the Standard and Poor's did this something called S and P investment valuation, something like that. Spiva. Index versus active. Hmm? Index versus active. Index versus active. Thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, this is the first time we had 15-year data. And you can see that large growth had a 5% chance, uh, large core about a 4% chance, uh, large value stores, you actually got a 17% chance of beating the market. And when you look at those numbers, you think, uh, you know, what's really, really the point of, um, of trying to fight these odds, uh, and, and maybe maybe it will get a little better for the active managers in the future. Uh, which gets to another question that you asked, and that is, okay, if everybody indexes, or if a lot of people index, uh, won't the market become less efficient, and active managers will be able to win? And the answer to that, I will tell you this in my typically understated manner, is that argument is categorically false categorically false. And why is it false? Because if indexing makes the market less efficient, and I'm not going to deal here with whether it will or not, I mean, I think it would have to be 70 or 80 or 90 percent index before we wouldn't even think about an issue like this, and we're nowhere near that now. Uh, but even, the, even if at some level the market were made less efficient, it would be easier for active managers to pick good stocks and win. But never forget those active managers are buying those stocks from other managers. 
So the managers that are selling to the active managers are going to do worse. So the spread between the best performing funds and the worst performing funds in the inefficient market uh, will, will, be made, will, will be probably wider, but on average, the best performing funds and the worst performing funds will be average minus their costs. So the inefficient market does not hold up to tests of logic uh, or anything of that nature. So to me, the case is closed. I don't think I probably need to tell, I don't think I need to tell, sell uh, Professor Tower on this argument, but um, it's, and let me say, particularly the young people in the room, one more thing, and that is, okay, suppose Vogel is totally wrong. Uh, which is, I, I guess, one would say always a possibility, despite what I said this morning. And then, then I'd say, when you're starting off with a little amount of money, is start off with an index fund. You're not bound for it for 100 years. And if you're not happy with the results after five years, when you maybe have accumulated 10000 or $20,000, whatever it might be, a modest amount, go do something better uh, if, you, if you're not satisfied with the results. I think the chances you will look at the index five years from now and say, here is a better way that existed all those years ago, and I wish I'd done it. If you only got a modest amount of money, it's not, gonna, it's not going to matter a great deal. Uh, so you've learned how to invest. You've learned how to take the ups and downs. Uh, you've learned how to deal with things like the, these remarkable ups and downs in the last few weeks, the volatility in the market. and. Uh, so you, you'll learn what investing is about in a simple way. And if you want to complicate it, pay higher costs and, and deal with an extremely problematic lifetime strategy, you know, please be my guest. But I believe in the index funds, and I also believe in, in, the, in the fact that, for example, well, a number of questions were asked, let me try this one, about why do we have managed funds at Vanguard? And uh, the answer is, one, is not particularly satisfactory, and as we always have, and it seems like, you know, going back to my beginning of my career, Wellington Fund was the only fund that we had at, at the Wellington Management Company when I started there in 1951. And so you come up to the index era and say, these people bought an active fund, uh, they liked it. Is it really up to me to tell them that they're, we're going to turn it into an into a index, balance, balance index fund? And I that was just peremptory and, and arrogant. So we started a balanced index fund, which they can use if they prefer it. Uh, but when you get to Wellington Fund, and this is true of so many mutual funds, and it's been untouched, really, by the press, and that is most mutual funds are heavily dependent on their index benchmarks. And have we got that benchmark thing in there? Next band? Oh, no, we don't have that in there. Uh, if you look at Wellington Fund, its target, its target index is 65% um, S&P 500, 35% corporate bond, Barclay Bloomberg corporate bond index. And it does a correlation, an R squared actually, uh, of 97% uh, with that benchmark. I think 97% is right. So it's 97% index now. So your question should be, maybe I shouldn't mention this, why are we paying them all that money to run it if it's really an index fund? And that is a good question. We should only pay on the 3%. But most funds, you know, it's going to be very rare. If you look at, look at the statistics, you, and, you were the studying this business, it's going to be very rare to find a fund that's much under, eight, much under a 90 R squared with its target and exceedingly rare uh, to find one under 80. I'm inclined to define it to find one that has under a 70%, 75% correlation with its index. So we're going to have uh, that kind of issue going on before us. And then I also want to say a couple of things about, you know, I'll just say a couple more things before we go to the Q&A. And that is I want to talk a little bit about traditional index funds. That's the kind that I started, that S&P 500, the first index mutual fund back in 1975, started underwritten in 1976 with these uh, Latter-day Saints that have come along called exchange-traded funds. And I'm not much of a believer in exchange-traded funds, but I haven't. I think, oh, um, well, let's start off with TIS. Um, traditional index funds 
are passive funds for passive investors. And the passive funds are usually broad market index funds, predominantly. S&P 500, Russell 3000, and whatever, or Russell 1000, uh, total international uh, IPA index, uh, total world index now, total bond index, and the ETFs are passive funds, sort of, um, but they're, they're indexed against really weird things. If you can go to an exchange traded fund and, and get the stock market return multiplied by four times and bet whether it's going up or down every day. That's not the idea. It may be an S&P index fund, it is, uh, but for active investors. And passive investing is a good strategy, but it's not a good strategy for active investors because it involves a lot of trading. So how does this play out? Well, let's put this next chart up. And this is a little bit complicated to try and get through at the end of the year. But I was kind of puzzled when I, when I looked at some data not so long ago that showed that both traditional index funds and exchange-traded funds had essentially the same amount of 2017 assets, around $2 trillion. And I knew the ETFs were growing much faster and, and taking in much more cash flow. So I decided to do a simple test. I said, let's take that growth in assets and divide it into their net cash flow and into their market appreciation to break it into those two segments, which is where the asset growth comes from. And you'll see that two-thirds of the growth in ETFs has come from cash flow, and two-thirds of the growth in traditional index funds has come from market appreciation. Voila, market appreciation is investor return which was 8.4% a year for traditional index funds, and 5.5% for exchange-traded funds, and 7.2% for active funds. The ETFs didn't even beat active fund managers. The investors did not. And they didn't come anywhere near close to the investor return. And over that period, this happened to be the 13-year period we were looking at, I'm sure the, the, the traditional index fund in the, I think it was 13-year period, uh, one in 11 of the 13 years, I and mean, it's a very definite pattern. And cumulatively, the difference in capital you would have accumulated by those two strategies, 184% increase in, in the value of your asset in the traditional fund, and 101% of, of the increase in the, in the exchange-traded fund. So we're selling something that investors, I think the product itself is flawed, but the way investors are using it is flawed. They're trading very actively. Turnover is, you know, usually in the 600 to 1,000 percent per year range for these investors, and it's just not a winner's game. So how can draw all that cash flow? Well, we come back to the brokerage business. We come back to salesmen need something to sell. We come back to marketing. We come back to capitalizing on the hot idea of the day, and we come back to all these things are bad uh, for investors. And I've often said that uh, a good marketing idea is usually a bad investment idea. And I've had some good marketing ideas in my long career, and they have been bad investment ideas. I will make a quick exception of the S&P 500. So confessing my flaws, um, let me turn it over to the audience and, and ask any additional questions you have in, in this remaining um, just approximately 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you thanks for financial markets and what you're doing for us today. Uh, uh, do we have some questions from the audience? Would you come up and stand right here so Jack can see you? If he just turns around and faces the clock, he'll be able to see him. Yeah. From that seat, you can be seen. So you, you can stay right there. You can stay right there. We can look at the clock. And look at the clock. Look at okay. The clock. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Can you see me? Yes. Yes. So you mentioned TIFs. Um, that stands for traditional index funds, I think. Um, what would you recommend as far as a balanced index? I know um, BTI is a very popular ETF that you have that um, traces the, the U.S. stock market. Is there a TIF equivalent of that popular ETF that you have? Well, traditional index fund, we are balanced index fund, 60-40, which I talked about a little bit in the, in the course of the, 
thing, but that would, these are just equity funds that we've got here. Uh, at least I think they are. Yes. Uh, yeah, they are just equity funds. But this gets us to the, an important issue, which I'll comment a little bit on, on um, asset allocation. What is the right asset allocation for an investor at various stage of life? And in my little book of common sense investing, I talk about that having to do with his emotional tolerance for risk and his financial tolerance for risk, the two very different things. And if you can tolerate risk, uh, sad to say, I'm afraid from the answer, and they're giving a nice, simple answer to your question, you have to figure that out for yourself. Balanced index is 60% stock, 40% bonds. Welling and fund is about 65 stock, 35% bonds. Uh, I happen to be at my age and stage of life about 50-50 bonds and stocks, the more conservative of the market, which has cost me a lot of money, which I'm not sorry about. I mean, I feel good about it these days. I should give you this one little anecdote. Some, uh, some young man wrote to me, and this is described in my, in, in my book, uh, and he said he was worried about all these things that could happen in the world, nuclear war and pandemics and global trade wars and the collapse of our institutions in this country, and uh, global warming, all those things that are out there that make living on Earth in this day and age much more risky than we ever would have imagined. And he said he's concerned about that risk. What should I tell him about asset allocation? And I said, it really doesn't depend on that. It, it, everybody is aware of these risks, and nobody is aware of the extent they can happen. I mean, or with either nuclear war is going to happen or it is not going to happen. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not a 50% risk. <laughs> it's 100% one way or 100% the other. And I finally said to him, you know, these, these questions you have to answer based on your own uh, thinking about the markets, uh, based on your own financial ability to bear risk, based on your own sizing up of the factors that are out there. And I said, uh, I have 50% stocks and 50% bonds. And I spend half my time worrying about why I have so much in stocks and the other half wondering about worrying about why I have so little in stocks. And you can imagine which days I do which worry. Uh, so it's trying to get a perspective. And this, this, one of your questions earlier was, uh, what about my statement about um, don't, don't just stand there, do something? Was that one of the questions? Uh, or don't peek. Don't peek is what the question was. It's a great idea. You need discipline to avoid letting the market dominate your investment program. So um, you shouldn't, you should really have a big picture of what you're doing and then just stick with it. And don't worry about what your neighbor is doing. You're gonna do better than your neighbor over a long period of time, almost no matter what you do if you follow these kind of ideas. The emotion of the market uh, out of your mind and realize that in the long run, the market is nothing. Uh, the stock market is very deceptive. Uh, in the long run, the stock market not only does not create returns, but the stock market subtracts returns from the value that is created by corporate America. We're at that more of the world. And we're, corporate America gives you that value in dividend yields and in earnings growth. And in the long run, valuations in the market pretty much zero out. There's no upward trend or downward trend in price earnings multiple which is one good measure of value. So it's what corporate America creates in earnings growth and dividend yields. And the market just gives you that return finally, that's 100% of the market return in the long run, and then subtracts its own 2%, uh, which is roughly the cost of playing the game. So if you, if you invest uh, with the idea that the U.S. is growing and the U.S. will continue to grow, and I can't guarantee that to you, but I expect it to be true. I'm investing as if it were. Um, then forget all the peripherals, all the noise. As both Benjamin Graham and I said, I didn't realize he said it, and he didn't realize I said it, but uh, the daily emotions of the stock market are like a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And that's what we're seeing these days. So always quote Shakespeare when you're talking to a Duke audience. <laughs> Well, that was my very favorite play in high school. Uh, uh, would you come up and?
Amy Jack? Yes. So I've been a Vanguard investor from when it was a relatively small mutual fund company, and as it's grown to be ginormous, it feels objectively to me that the level of responsiveness to the individual investor is not what it was back when it was a smaller company. And there's much more of a focus on marketing to get individual investors to buy into their asset management services with an additional fee of what, about 35 basis points a year on top of the underlying mutual fund fee. And if it's not too close to home, as the founder, do you have any thoughts about the direction Vanguard is going and as to whether um, my own subjective feeling uh, of the focus uh, is legitimate? It's too close to home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. I, I, no, no, no. I, I, I don't mind commenting on it a little bit. Obviously, I can't. Would be inappropriate for me to say a lot, but uh, you are looking at a small company guy. I love the smallness. Uh, you're looking at a guy who likes the struggle much better than the momentum. That's me. Uh, those were the happiest days of my whole career. Now, I don't run this place anymore, and I, I think what we have is a, a desire to compete at the highest level, to be big to be heavily involved in marketing. We see that in everything we do, particularly these, this, these five new funds that we're just starting now. And um, I, I, who am I to second guess that? Uh, I worry a little bit about, and get criticized here, honestly, for it, about worrying about whether we're doing enough thinking about whether we are too big. Uh, and uh, my response to that is, if everybody in our management is not concerned about getting too big, they're not paying attention. Uh, you know, things don't grow forever. There will be government regulation. There will be, I mean, I don't know how you do it. I, I don't think it really matters. Uh, will our shareholder services be better and more focused on individuals at $5 trillion than at $2 trillion? I think it's indifferent. I think we do a very good job on that, as good as we possibly can. But I can, I can only answer so many letters, and I get a lot. And I answer them all by hand, and uh, I, lo I love my contact with the shareholders. And uh, I can tell you this, that uh, the satisfaction level of, sh of our shareholders with our service, uh, obviously with their returns, uh, how many letters say, I only wish I heard about you earlier? Probably half of them. Yeah. So if, if what comes with that is a greater demand for our services, more and more people uh, uh, joining us, more and more families entrusting their assets to us, there probably is uh, inevitably, when you get larger, uh, less person-to-person -person interface, uh, which I regret. But on the other hand, you've got to balance that with the fact that we're giving much better returns to vastly more numbers of investors. So, you know, it's a good question. I, I don't want to be any more candid than I have been, um, but uh, you know, companies change. When companies grow, companies change. When companies get big, they change. Uh, and I, I, I would not know how to do a better job on managing the company at these levels than the present management. That I can assure you. Uh, and I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't change places with them for the world. By the way, uh, they have to deal with all this, and I can sit here and. And I don't want to sit here in the in the critics' corner and tell them they're wrong, uh, even though, like all of us, they are wrong sometimes. <laughs> well, and on behalf of personal investors, thank you for all you've done. And in Vanguard's defense, even with the growth, the fees keep dropping. So uh, it, it, it's a good thing in many ways. Okay, so you, we're, we're together on that one. <laughs> I, just as an example of how uh, Jack writes letters, the very first paper I wrote on Vanguard, I got three handwritten notes uh, from Jack. Uh, uh, he didn't mince his words on the first one. He said, I'm sure you're dead wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have another That's question. me. Please come up, sir. 
Can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, so looking at that difference between ETF and traditional index fund returns, I'm wondering if that's entirely due to people owning ETFs and trading irresponsibly. So if I were to invest in ETF, let's say VTI now, and just buy and hold, would I have the same return as a traditional index fund? Absolutely. There's, the, there's nothing in ETFs that make you trade, except that's what they're there for. So you've got to be able to resist the temptation of being able to buy and sell every day or every hour. And uh, if you can do that, particularly in the Vanguard case, that the identical portfolios, this is unusual to the ETF business, that the identical portfolios of the 500 ETF and the 500 traditional index fund, so you will get the same return. And uh, it could be, a, there's, a, there's been an argument about whether more, one is more tax efficient than the other. In our case, it hasn't it hasn't mattered because we haven't had any trading in the in the traditional index fund, so they should be you should be getting, able to get the identical return. I mean, maybe because of dividend reinvestment, they'll be moderately different, but I couldn't tell you who would win on that side and who would lose. So an ETF is fine. Well, an exchange traded fund is perfectly good just so long as you don't trade it. That may sound like an option. A little bit like an oxymoron, and maybe it is. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I saw half a hand here, and uh, then uh, Steve Thorpe will, will close. Uh, good morning. Love to hear your uh, views on interest rate and total bond return in a rising rate environment. Uh, or put another way, what do you do when you see a spinning buzzsaw coming at you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what, what I do, uh, and, and I think you're right, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting, first let me make a comment about perspective, time perspective. Uh, there is no question that over the next 25 years, they're going to be better off in a long-term bond fund than a short because the the, the short is going to give you a lower interest rate, and the interest rate will pay off in that period. You're going to have a lot more volatility. Uh, but in the short run, uh, if you're trading bonds or buying for short term, uh, the risk in, in long-term bonds is very great. So what I do, in my, I, I think I mentioned to you that I'm about half bonds, half stock. In my bond position, counting me at my municipals and my personal position, and my uh, the corporates in my in, in my uh, pension that retirement plan account. Uh, I'm about in that 50%. I'm about give or take 25% of the total, 25 percentage points of the total, half of the total, is in a short term or limited term, very short, and the other 25% is in intermediate. I don't do long because I don't like the bouncing around. It may be better for me in the long run. But one looks at the long run a little differently when one is about to be 89 years old, <laughs> and I can assure you. So uh, it, it's, it's, you don't have to go, a bond is, is, is not a commodity. The bond depends on its interest rate, its duration, which I'm sure all you students are familiar with. And those durations get very high. And you look at some of these people selling 100-year bonds now, God knows what the duration of a 100-year bond is, probably 80 years or something like that. Uh, and that means a huge fluctuation. Well, maybe it's more like 60. I can't do it in my head. But uh, so you want to be very careful in bonds. If you're really careful, you can go in the money market instead of bonds. But the yields are so low that I think even my intermediate term, which is probably in the corporate side around, let me guess at 3.2 uh, or 3.3 percent, after a certain number of years, that extra return will offset uh, the decline you had in the capital value due to the rising interest rates. So yes, rising interest rates are a risk. Uh, you could argue, as you have argued, rising interest rates are a certainty, and I think that's probably a, a little more accurate way of looking at it, although my long experience tells me that nothing in the market is ever certain. Thank you. Steve? So I'm not sure I have a final question, but uh, Jack, I guess on behalf of everybody in the room and Vanguard investors everywhere, uh, we're so grateful for your relentless uh, advocacy on our behalf for so many years. 
and I'm confident that they're saving hundreds of billions of dollars for investors worldwide. So, and also, thank you so much for joining us today. It was, it was great. My pleasure, and good luck to all of you. Be, uh, uh, arriving in your office shortly. One of the uh, yep. We have them already. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm uh, very grateful to you and to, to Mike uh, uh, and to, uh, uh, Emily uh, uh, and to Kathy for uh, for making all of this happen. Uh, my uh, my son tells me that uh, his son absolutely loves his lemur. That he uh, uh, grabs this lemur by the tail throws it against the wall, and then uh, spends uh, a number of minutes comforting it for a uh, rough past and, uh, uh, and uh, wishing it the best for the future. And uh, so I hope you're able to uh, uh, find uh, young friends who will. Uh, well, we, we have them right there, and I thank you very much. That was terrific. And Kathy's very excited, and Emily will be when she comes in on Monday. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jack. Very great. Good luck, everybody.